Greetings and salutations and welcome back, friends. Uh, tonight is uh, a return, uh, I suppose. Many of you have been asking me why we haven't had any guests uh, lately. And I, I suppose uh, that I just haven't uh, reached out to uh, many people uh, to ask them to do a guest. But I realized uh, recently uh, that uh, one of my favorite Twitter follows is Mr. Jeff Knox on Twitter. Um, who is a walking encyclopedia of UFO cases and posts daily, like this day in UFO history, what happened on this day. Uh, he is, like I said, he's just a walking encyclopedia of UFO cases and history. Unlike some other so-called UFO historians uh, who are selling people superpowers for $59, uh, you know, sometimes it's the unsung heroes that you really need to pay more attention to and not the sensationalist clickbait garbage peddlers. Uh, so uh, I thought it would be a good idea if people want me to have guests, make sure that we have. And that's another issue. We got, you know, I can't just host wackadoos here. We, we have to have good quality guests or quite honestly, the live chat rips apart some people. Uh, that we've had. And by the way, please always, uh, you know, be kind to the guests here, regardless of if you disagree with them, we can remain civil and, uh, you know, just be conscious of these people that are essentially volunteering their time to bring us uh, some information. So uh, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, oh, I mentioned the, the reason that I asked Mr. Jeff Knox here is because I just saw an excellent presentation he did on another show and and not to slag off the other show or anything like that, but they're maybe they're like a newer show or something, but they don't have very big audience. And I thought, wow, this presentation was so great. I, I think more people should see it. And one of the benefits of our growing platform here is that, uh, you know, we can reach many more people. So uh, we're going to bring him right in here. Welcome, Mr. Jeff Knox. Hello, hello. Greetings and salutations. And also, you and I haven't talked about a lot of the recent happenings, the Arrow report, this Dave Grush, we're up to what, 305 days, no evidence, the so Elizondo. Is. Yeah, the Elizondo revelation. So I thought selfishly, instead of just talking to you off air, we'll just talk about that here tonight and my audience can come along with me. But you have this excellent presentation on some of these historical UFO cases, which reminded me, Jeff, that it's okay to enjoy the world of UFOs. You know, I tend to get so cynical and bitter and angry of all the fraud cases and stuff, but there are some genuine interesting mysteries out there, especially yeah. when we get into some of these historical cases, right? Yep. Yeah. There's some some strange ones. Some strange ones and not so strange ones, but there's, there's a lot of good stuff in this topic that just uh, you don't need to, like, attach yourself to like a case that gets explained like there's so much good stuff out there that's still unexplained that doesn't necessarily mean it's aliens but that it's it's unexplained and interesting to check out you know no need to die with one case you know it's a big topic so. okay so did you want to just jump right into the presentation or first did you want to tell us a little um, bit about these cases and and your sort of methodology of putting them together? Is there like a, a line that connects some of these or, you know, like an overarching theme? Yeah, so uh, the ones in my presentation, kind of the, the first few items are more like a historical uh, item. Uh, it's more about the history of how the government started investigating UFOs, which kind of gets into the era report a bit because they talk about the start of the government's UFO projects and when they started to investigate. And so those kind of all those first kind of four or five things kind of all linked together and they're about the end of december of 1947 when the government's kind of putting together their plans to start project sign and all that and i kind of share a case which is interesting because it's uh, the first case ever where a ufo uh witness was hypnotized and this was in sweden oh, that's back interesting. In, uh, in the 1950s and the next couple of cases actually directly relate to the the witness perception kind of stuff I want to talk about. There are sure. a couple of a Cosmo satellite reentries and uh, an old airship uh, case going on. I love those airship mysteries. <laughs> yes, they're, they are very interesting. 
So do you just want me to uh, just run through this presentation and then we can talk about the other stuff? And sure, sure, yeah, yeah. And, and if you don't mind, we may have some questions along the way, or yeah, sure, sure. Uh, bear with me. Usually, I have somebody else controlling my slides here. So let's see if I can. Um, yeah, you just go to present there here. down at the bottom. Sure. Uh, and we'll. Uh, Share, or maybe if I have to share the entire, let's see, there's an entire screen. That could be dangerous. I, I closed all, all my sensitive windows. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm good to add this now. We can add this. I'm good. Yes, all right, sure. you're good. Go ahead. Here we go. Yeah. There you go. Can you guys see that? Yes, definitely. Mr. Curtis LeMay. Cool, cool, cool. So yeah, at the end of basically the end of December, uh, December 18th, we had a guy named James Oliver Jr. and a Lieutenant Colonel Thomas of the Offensive Air Section respond to a request by the Deputy Chief of Staff for Research and Development, General Curtis LeMay, asking about the status of the flying disc analysis. They complete a reanalysis using documents from the Pentagon and Wright-Patterson and write a new what's called a element a e -E -E, essential elements of information indicating a potentially serious but puzzling phenomenon then turn this over to the chief of air force intelligence mcdonald for his signature four days later though on the 22nd that final eei which is called the analysis of flying disc reports is issued by the chief of air force intelligence george uh mcdonald who concurs with the Air Material Command's recommendation of September 23rd, forwards that on to the research, U.S. Air Force Research and Development, General Lawrence Cardi Craigie for reply. General Charles Cabell, the new chief of AFORI, signs off on this. A little over just a week later on December 30th, is, based, is this when the order for Project Sign comes in to make Project Sign an official project. Now, Project Saucer, is what they talk about being the start of the government's investigation efforts. Project Saucer was used as an informal name for Project Sign, but it was also the name of the project before Sign before Sign was formalized into official project. Oh, so, so they called it Project Saucer at first? Yes, they called it Project Saucer at That's first. That's interesting. That's interesting. And you might kind of think of it as like uh, there was dispute of when the UAP task force started. You know, there's one that actually started in law, but that they were already kind of operating for a while before that, you know, so there's always kind of like an informal project before they get it formalized. And Project Saucer kind of started off as the informal project that got formalized into Project Sign on December 30th. Now, the Air Report says that it, Project Saucer started in 1946, which is utter nonsense. That's not even possible. Uh, you might imagine it's UFOs mm -hmm. were not saucers until uh the kenneth arnold sighting in 1947 so there was no way there was a project saucer that existed in 1946 one of the few inaccuracies in the report but anyways on uh, december 30th uh general lawrence craigie director of the u.s air force research and development successor to curtis lemay who had returned to europe at that point advised the air material command general that u.s air force policy is not to ignore the ufo reports but to collect, evaluate, and act on the information. Uh, he establishes Project Sign, otherwise known as Project HT-304, uh, in a memo titled Flying Disc. Alfred Loading, who is convinced that the flying disc are extraterrestrial, may have come up with the sign designation. It carries a 2A restricted classification. Craigie, after his retirement from the Air Force in 1955, would be asked uh, about the UFO project, and he said he would believe that it was a waste of time, and he only approved Project Sign because of internal U.S. Air Force politics. Now, three weeks later, on the 22nd, is when Sign would officially launch uh, at Wright Field, which is now Wright-Patterson Air Force Base near Dayton, Ohio. The primary investigators would be a Captain Robert Schneider, the project chief, Alfred Loading, T3 engineer, Lawrence Tretner, T2 engineer, Colonel Albert D. Armand, who was an analyst in the Intelligence Analysis Division. Also involved are Major Raymond Llewellyn, who is Chief of Special Projects, Lieutenant Howard W. Smith, George W. Towles, and others as assigned. How much interest Colonel Howard McCoy takes in the project is unknown. Its task is to collect, collate, evaluate, distribute information on sightings in the atmosphere, which it can be considered of a concern to national security. 
Rupert later says that for an unknown to be considered unknown, it has to come from a competent observer and contain a reasonable amount of data. So that's just kind of our background there on the start of the government's UFO investigative efforts. Of course, they did look at earlier things like ghost rockets in the 46, you know, but they didn't really, it wasn't like a formal investigation effort. That that Project Saucer, which became Project Sign, was the first. So do you think that like the, the uh, Roswell event and also the Kenneth Arnold sighting is what kicked them, which kind of made, you know, they had to do some kind of project like this? Yeah, it, it really was that after the Arnold sighting, of course, there was the you know, the, the Maury Island hoax supposedly a few days before that. But uh, yeah, it was really the Kenneth Arnold side and it kind of kicked off the whole saucer era and got that whole summer, you know, a whole flood of reports and got the ball rolling that by the end of the year, they had started an official project, but they were already investigating at that point. Right. So Kenneth Arnold sighting was already in, was investigated by Project Saucer, the informal project. Uh, that was one of the main things. That's interesting. Did. And somebody in the live chat asked, is there any reason it, it was V asked? And I think this is a good question. Is there any reason they picked the word sign? It seems like an odd name for a UFO study project. Yeah, that's 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 a good question. They're looking for the sign. You know, is this a sign from extraterrestrials or wh whatever? It's odd word choice, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if we know that. Like I say, it's, it's speculated that it was, you know, loading that came up with the name sign uh, for the project. But did I say that right? Loading, 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 loading. Yeah, loading. But that I, I don't think, uh, I don't think we know why it was called that. Even in the other cases, like we Blue Book is like kind of a one they wanted, like, a, I guess, a neutral kind of like color, but also a reference to the testing books that would be used in colleges and stuff. Um, grudge, you know, was supposedly because they were kind of irritated with the whole thing. <laughs> they had a well, grudge this, against UFO whack. Yeah, basically. Right? Yeah. But, I've heard that. Know, all this is like it's it's anecdotal. You know, we don't actually know for sure why they called what what. But that that's what they say anyways. Yeah, so. interesting. And it's interesting. Maybe there's a reason that there's so much mythology around UFOs and aliens with Wright Patterson, because there we have it, one of the first real, you know, serious study efforts. And it was at Wright Field, which later became Wright Patterson, right? Yep. Yep. They, uh, yeah, Wright Field became Wright Patterson and that's where it's at. And, and you know, where, where it's at now, all that later became in what is now what they call the National Space and Intelligence Center. So like mm -hmm. what used to be the old project during Blue Book is now just that NASAC that, uh, yeah, the Air Technical Intelligence Center, ATIC that ran Blue Book is now uh, NASAC, the National Air and Space Intelligence Center that they have at Dayton. That there was a conference just a year or so ago, a bunch of people were going to that the UFO Twitter went crazy speculating that it was about UFOs. But, yeah. <laughs> you gotta love UFO Twitter. <laughs> gotta love it. Never dull, this right? Next this next case, I was not familiar with this one at all. I've never heard of this one. And, and you know, that's what always fascinates me. Sometimes you think like, well, I, I've looked into all the cases or, or most of them. And then you come across one like this. I know nothing about this one. So tell us about this. Yeah, the, this is the this is an interesting one. And, and the, the occupants, you know, being blobs are fairly interesting as well. It's a, it's a Swedish case. And sometimes we don't get exposed to foreign cases as often as we should. You know, we I think a lot of the cases we get are biased towards, you know, like English speaking countries. But yeah, well, did you see that? Did you see that recent somebody shared on uh, a lot of different platforms? I'm sure I saw it a bunch of times that UFO cases reported map in the world. And like the United States was lit up like a Christmas tree and all the other countries just had a few dots in them. So there's something weird about that. Apparently, yeah. the, the aliens really like the United States the best, apparently. Yeah, there's so many factors that go into, like, whether something even gets reported and how it gets reported. And, like, a lot of our data is heavily biased. And that, that's why a lot of these, these studies they do that suggest the UFOs are attracted to nuclear bases are kind of fundamentally flawed statistically, like, because they're using kind of this, like, biased data pool. For example, like, when you only look at, military cases 
of course you're going to find a correlation between military zones and ufo sightings yeah i agree with you yeah. you know so like yeah there's there's a lot of pitfalls that come into these things like mapping and well besides that so, so many military bases have aircraft coming and going so exactly. off in the distance through the clouds atmospheric phenomenon and you just see the lights of a of a conventional aircraft and it could look very strange i've always thought about that like there's yeah. got to be a reason there's so many near military and air bases. It's because of the activity level of flying craft in those areas, you know. And I think they're more people are more vigilant around those areas and watching the sky, you know, for intruders and security purposes. And you know, there's just there's a lot of factors. Obviously, the military is more vigilant about watching their ranges and their zones, so that's why they're going to detect them. But anyways, yeah. yeah. So with this case. Uh, this this case happened on December 20th, 1958. About 2.55 a.m., a Hans Gustafsson, a 24-year-old truck driver, and Stig Rydberg, a 30-year-old student, claimed that while driving home from Helsingborg, Sweden, from a dance, they see a strange light in the glade on the way to Domston. They leave the car and walk up to the object, which turns out to be a dish-shaped vehicle, 16 feet in diameter, resting on three legs. The two are suddenly attacked by four gray creatures about four feet tall who try to drag them into the UFO. Blob monsters, basically. Yeah, right? pretty much. They're like uh, blob monsters. I've never seen this case. This is interesting. Blob monsters there's, attack. There's that, The movie The Blob is actually based on a real case as well. So Really? I never uh, knew that. I never yeah, knew that. I loved that 50s version growing up because my father was a fan of like 1950s science fiction because he grew up with that. So, on, mm -hmm. you know, remember when you were a kid, like Saturday afternoon on, on you know, crappy VHS or v yeah. UHF, you know, you, <laughs> they would oh, play I, the Blob watched, movie all the time. I watch a huge amount of old, like, schlocky 1950s science fiction movies pretty much every week. So yeah, I see you posted about some of them, and it, and it reminds me of my my father he, who loved that kind of stuff. He he loved the day that Earth stood still was probably his favorite, That's his favorite fifties one. one. Yeah. So tell us yeah. a little more about this blob monster case. Yeah. So after these creatures basically tried to drag them to the UFO, I guess in in January nineteen fifty nine, a medical doctor, a, a Lars Eric Essen, hypnotizes the men. Uh, into what's perhaps the first use of hypnosis hypnosis on a UFO witness. But the two managed to fool the hypnotist. In the late 1980s, Gustafsson's brother Arthur reveals to uh, ufologist Klaus Vaughn that before he died, his uh, brother had told him the story was a hoax. So, wow. uh, so this one turns yeah. out to be a hoax. Isn't it funny how like some of these hoaxes take... 40 years or 50 years before people admit that it was all made up. Yeah. They, sometimes they take a long time and then sometimes it's been so long. They're never admitted because they figure it's too long. They're in too deep. <clears throat> Bob Lazar. <clears throat> <laughs> hey, shut up. Just because he's a convicted pimp and a fake scientist doesn't mean he's not telling the truth about those aliens. Jeff Knox. It's, it's, it's possible. Possible, oh, that reminds me. You know, I'm doing a free documentary, Bob Lazar, The Rest of the Story. And uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I wanted to include some of your thoughts in that. I thought that would be yeah. great because I, I know that you were like, for those unaware, like Jeff was like me, like he went to the ends of the earth trying to prove or disprove this case. So we, we definitely would love to include you in that. Way too much time, money and effort. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, you, you, you think you're going to like figure it out so you can prove to everyone it's bullshit, but really it doesn't matter what you find. There are always going to be people that buy it. So <laughs> blah, bizarre. <laughs> blah, bizarre. All right. So then there was, I love flaps for those unaware. Can you explain what a UFO flap is before we get into this one? Yeah. Yeah. So like, now, I probably I'm going to butcher this because there's actually kind of conflicting definitions. Like, technically, there's a difference between a wave and a flap. And don't particularly ask me to explain the difference. But, like, a flap is essentially, like, like a short time period where there's a rapid rise in a UFO sighting. It's in kind of, like, a localized area. 
typically there's like a lot of kind of media coverage about it and so you get a lot of a lot of sightings condensed in a, a small spatio-temporal location and there was one of these kind of like flaps that kind of occurred in virginia in 1965 that kind of started off at the beginning of 1964 mm -hmm. with a particular kind of like famous case uh it, it actually started off the night uh the same night uh, a little bit earlier at 4 50 p.m with a 14 year old boy named kenneth norton who was looking out his bedroom window in staunton virginia and he saw a fast moving object without wings or any tail structure he describes it as cigar shaped and about 125 feet in diameter he sees it for about five seconds now in 125 feet in diameter remember that because in 10 minutes this other guy this is kind of the more famous case it's been called like a beehive shaped ufo um it's been that reminds me of the wedding cake yeah or we a wedding cake <laughs> or, or, or no something. you know the billy meyer wedding cake because it billy meyer wedding stages cake. yes uh you gotta love that billy hub meyer man. uh crash can lids and hubcaps it's awesome yeah hey you know i i prefer the fake photos they're so much more beautiful than then you got to give it to Billy Meyer. Some of those Billy photos, are, some of those photos are really nice, even though they're you know they're fake. You know, yeah, like like I'd I'd frame a Meyer photo and put it on the wall, like just because it's cool looking, even though it's BS. But uh, well, you know, you know how I got around that. I actually did that, but I took Phil Langdon's versions because then I felt like I wasn't supporting Billy Meyer because they look exactly the same. But it was the same that could recreate it and made the, the Phil Langdon, you know, he recreated Who's that it. artist guy that draws the Meyer stuff, Jim, Jim something. Oh yeah. He, he passed away a few years ago. Yeah. Those are kind of yeah. cool. Those classic. He had that documentary yeah. like about Alderan and all. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember his name. If somebody knows in the live chat, let us know. It's Jim somebody. Yeah. Shame. He, he did a lot. He did a lot of really interesting stuff. At least if you, you got to admire his artistic side, because he used to he used to make a this guy used to make a documentary and he would draw like hundreds of, of illustrations and then he would narrate over it and put music in. And it was kind of crude, but Nichols, Jim Nichols, I think Jim Nichols. Yeah, that you're right. Yeah. You're right. Rest in peace, Jim Nichols. I enjoyed his some of his stuff. He's yeah. one of those guys I did not get to. Um, I didn't get to interview. That was on my list. And I still have emails from him canceling on me three times. I asked him wow. a bunch of times and he would schedule and then cancel. So what, well, but rest in peace, you know, you can look him up. Look, I can't remember it's something about just look up Jim Nichols Alderan on YouTube and you'll find some of his old documentaries that he did. I think there's like an art book or something maybe too. Like, yes, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So this one, a car engine fails after an object lands and this is a common trope in UFO stories that they have some sort of electrical interference prop properties that kill car batteries or kill car, uh, you know, something. Yeah, something, the, the, yeah. Car, the car stoppers or the car stopper cases or the vehicle interference cases, as they're sometimes called. Yep, this this is one that that supposedly happened. Uh, and this is just ten minutes after the last guy, right at five p.m. This guy's driving on uh, east on U.S. Highway 250, Horace Burns. He's approaching Fisherville when he notices an enormous cone-shaped object appear from the north and descend slowly at a gradual slant. Just before it crosses the highway 200 feet in front of him, the UFO narrowly misses power lines. It is so huge that when it passes nearly in front of him, it fills his entire windshield. The UFO comes down gently and lands into a field to Burns' right. Meanwhile, Burns' car engine has shut off. The object appears to be 125 feet in diameter, which is the same as the last guy I saw 10 minutes before, and 80 to 90 feet high. After 60 to 90 seconds, it rises up several hundred feet, makes a sound like rushing air, and then shoots off to the northeast and vanishes from sight. A huge level, a high level of radioactivity is detected at the site on December 30th by investigators German professor Ernst G. Gaiman and engineer Harry M. Cook. Well, so this is where theory. Jeff, this is where it gets this is the kind of case that I think is very interesting because you have multiple witnesses seeing the same thing, and then you actually have some scientific data in the form of the radiation being detected in the area, right? Yeah, it, it, it at least kind of tells you something 
happened. Now, what happened there, who knows, but something happened. When you, when you can tie traces and potentially photos, testimony. Up there. Something that, that odd definitely big, happened to. Uh, yeah, it's show. just better than just somebody telling yeah. you a story and they got nothing. But yeah, so this so they, they check out the uh, car with their basically with the Geiger counter and they get a reading of 16 to 18 millirads an hour. Now, two, uh, two Blue Book investigators, uh, Technical Sergeant David Moody and a Staff Sergeant Hale T. Jones, they would visit the site with Gaiman again uh, almost two weeks later on the 12th of January and take further readings. Their readings only showed one and a half millirads an hour on Burns' left rear car door. They end up they dispute Gaiman's earlier results, but they admit that it's possible that an 11 to 12 drop in times drop in radiation level over the 13 days could indicate a radionucleotide with a three to four day half life. So it's it's an interesting case. So, you know, you you have some radiation and it dropped, you know, within a couple of weeks. And uh, but you saw had multiple people and those you got to also remember it took place in a massive flap for the time period. That was just kind of the start that kicked off this like big major flap. Yeah. Oh, those are those. I like the flap cases or the wave cases because when, when there's so many people in the same area seeing similar or the same objects in the sky. That means there's some kind of meat on the bones, Jeff. It's not just yeah. it's not just nonsense, you know? And now we get into the airship panic. And, this and is interesting. These last couple cases, you know, had many witnesses, hundreds if not thousands of people, uh, you know, saw these events. Uh, this is a particularly famous uh, airship panic. You know, the, the airship cases kind of really started kicking off in 1896 to 1897. But there was a couple of other major flaps, right? There was the 1909, you know, flap in New England. I mean, yeah, New England. Uh, there was like a, a Michigan airship flap, a Nebraska airship flap. There was basically the the scare ships in uh, the UK. You know, like there, there was one right in there was one right where I live, Warminster, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. There was a big flap, a big yeah bunch of sightings in the same time period. Uh, right where I live, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, and and uh, interestingly, I met one of those original witnesses that was on UFO Hunters. Do you remember that case where she said the UFO like ejected something out of it and it was on a tree? It like went on her tree. Anyway, I, I talked to that woman because she lives right near me. Oh, yeah? Huh. Yeah. Yeah. But tell us more about these airships. And yeah. and uh, do you think that these a lot of these airship mysteries were just early experimenters in ballooning or you know blimps or so? My well, first tell us about the case, and then <laughs> we'll try to draw some yeah, conclusions. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about this case. So, so on on December twenty second, nineteen oh nine, at about six thirty p.m., uh, many residents of Worcester, uh, Massachusetts, see a brilliant ray emitted by this large black object about a thousand feet high in the southwestern sky. After it circles over the town, the object heads to the west where it is seen over Marlboro. It returns to Worcester between 7 and 7.30 p.m., flying at a low altitude and spotting a searchlight. One policeman thinks he sees enormous wings. Others detect uh, figures inside. The airship is uh, attributed to this Worcester businessman named Wallace E. Tillingas. And if you're ever looked into the airship stories, this is a pretty famous guy that comes up a lot because he had told the Boston Herald on December 12th that he had invented a heavier than air monoplane and that he had made over 100 test flights at night in Boston and New York City. But Tillingas, of course, never offers up his aircraft for public viewing and people gradually realize it's a hoax. We call this TTSA 1890s. No, sorry. Um, anyways, uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's that's just one of many in a huge, huge flap. And if you actually follow me on Twitter, uh, the the beginning of April is kind of like it's kind of like when the major airship stuff like happened. There, there was cases throughout the rest of the year, but I've just got like sometimes five or six on a single day coming up over the next you know couple of weeks so if you're interested in old airship cases got a ton of those coming up for you but as far as what they are you know i think again as you'll see with the rest of this presentation 
I think a lot of them could just potentially be misidentified uh, fireballs, meteors that people see that they interpreted as airships. Uh, yeah, and this was pre those those some of those a lot of this airship mystery stuff is pre Wright brothers. Yeah, which is why it always was interesting to me because you, yeah, they, they can't be mistaken an airplane or a helicopter because those didn't even exist at the time. So those cases are always interesting to yeah, me. Yeah, historians say there was no airships operating at the time. You know, there's never been any evidence really per se for that. Now they did start to develop some that they tested. Uh, you know, towards the, you know, probably a little before 1909, but. You know, they weren't flying around the country. They were like small test flights and things like that, you know, so. Or tethered. I, I've heard a lot yeah, of tethered. early early balloon and, and airships were like tethered to the ground by a lot of ropes. They were too nervous to just let them, the early ones, just fly free. So they used to tether them and, you know. Yeah, one of the famous early photos of one of the first kind of earlier airship testings, I think it's from 19. 1907 or 1909 or something like that it's tethered like it's tethered to the ground you can see the guy kind of like hanging there but it's the whole thing's tethered to the ground while it's in there so yeah i'm not convinced that any of them were any actual ships at least in the earlier years you know maybe by 1909 or some of this 1913 stuff like there was some maybe some were balloons that were just mistaken uh yeah Anyways, so uh yes, yeah, so the cosmos re-entry uh yeah, a lot so, of, there's a lot of UFO cases that I think center around space junk re-entries, you know, uh exactly. Kecksburg maybe was maybe a, a satellite coming down and this is the, another of those type of satellites that the Russians had that deorbited, right? Or or came came down yeah. through the atmosphere. And those yeah. are tremendous uh, sort of sights to see, right? They usually result in big fireballs in the sky. They're pretty, pretty remarkable. And, and as we'll see in a little bit here, like the kind of descriptions people give just when they see these kind of events here, you know, and before, another big event that I had previously kind of talked about was the, the famous giant Yukon UFO case from 1996. You know, that supposed that had all these witnesses and it was supposed to be this mothership UFO that ended up being identified as a Cosmos 2335 rocket that was re-entering the area at the same time. Yeah. And, and like many of these cases, the witness describing you know, like portholes, rows of lights, etc. So Yeah. So human perception plays a role in some of these UFO cases. It's easy when you're looking at an object that's maybe a few miles in the, you know, 10 or 20 miles away from you in the sky that you could mm -hmm. be mistaken in your perceptions, right? Yeah. And, and you don't even know, you don't even know distances. Like, so like when somebody says they see something and they think it's only a couple thousand feet up, it could actually, like in these cases specifically, I'm about to tell you about, could actually, you know, it's many, many miles away. It's not a couple thousand feet up. Or it's, it's not airplane level like it's it's almost impossible to judge distances particularly at night so yeah so this so this case here though uh, this cosmos 749 re-entry happened on christmas day in december uh 1980 uh, basically at 9 p.m the soviet spy satellite known as cosmos 749 re-entered the earth's atmosphere breaking up into several pieces creating a spectacular fireworks display over northwest europe uh, police stations, the Coast Guard, and the RAF end up getting hundreds of calls reporting four or five comet-like objects uh, leaving bright trails. Astronomers also record three fireball meteors the same night, the largest and brightest appearing at 3 a.m. Cosmos 749 was actually a Selena Zero class spy satellite that was launched on a Cosmos 3M vehicle back in July 4th, 1975. We had another particularly interesting event happen on New Year's Eve of uh, 1978. Yeah, now look, look at this, Jeff. If you didn't know better and you just saw this thing in the sky, yeah, you would think that's an alien spaceship. That looks like that's you could easily mistake that. It doesn't look like a conventional human yeah. spacecraft. It's yeah. a very interesting design. And but this is just a rocket booster, right? Ross Colthart's balls right here. That <laughs> the mothership. 
Well, I wonder if anybody got any shavings off theirs. Yeah. Off that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's they're weird looking, right? And, and this event actually allowed UFO investigators to learn quite a bit from it. Uh, so at 7 p.m., hundreds of people in the United Kingdom, uh, and this is New Year's Eve, uh, see a bright light with a long uh, trail behind it as it streaks across the heavens from northwest to southeast. And they got hundreds of these reports, right? Like just hundreds, hundreds wow, hundreds of them, and they that kind of allowed them to really learn from this case here. So RF Blindale's at the North York Moors, England, quickly identifies it though as the re-entry of a booster rocket that launched a Russian satellite, Cosmos 1068, into orbit on December 26th. Now, Jenny Randalls examines the reports of the re-entry, which in general accurately reflect the event and compares them to UFO reports, concluding that she thinks it's unlikely that all UFOs are just identified in various degrees of exaggeration. And like I said, they were able to, knowing that it was the Cosmos, uh, the rocket booster re-entry, go and record reports from hundreds of people just to see what they reported and then they were able to kind of create like a kind of like a, a baseline comparing all these like salient features of UFO reports, like to what was seen from this rocket entry. And then you can kind of compare them. Right. And you look at all these pictures here, you know, like these are all from that night and you've, we've got, you know, cigars, we've got portholes, we've got windows, we've, we've got disc, you know, we've got Tic Tacs, we've got whatever you want people were seeing it and they were all looking at the same thing yeah so drawing. that that's a, that's a testament to the to the human perception problem with ufo reports because yeah they they were all looking at the very same exact object but multiple witnesses described it in different ways like you said different shapes different colors yeah yeah but now, now one thing they did did learn though is that people while they disagreed sometimes on details they were fairly generally accurate in like the general features of the report, right? So like most people reported the event as lasting anywhere from like one to three minutes. Um, in reality, it was m most likely a bit under a minute, but most people fed in that category. There were some outliers that reported over 10 minutes, you know, a couple of people that got the the hour wrong by an hour or two but most people roughly got the start time right they roughly got the duration right there is only a few outliers most people got the general direction they saw it going right but with any case like this and i've looked at other fireball re-entries there will always be a few people that think it's going the opposite direction of everyone else or i think they see it for 15 minutes you know instead of two minutes and you might think 29 palms this is another another situation just like this right you get people saying how can it be flares flares only last several minutes the witnesses say it lasted 10 minutes flares don't last that long well again you, you're presuming the witness is 100 percent accurate on how long they sure. saw something yeah yeah and that's not always the case right like you're not disputing they saw something it's the details that that get kind of distorted and inaccurate like yeah, and when you're seeing something right. extraordinary, I think that time seems to slow down for some people or speed up for some people because of adrenaline and excitement and, and all these things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is interesting. This this could be mistaken for a tic tac or more modern sighting. Well, yeah, this is a that's the famous Charles Witted. And and so and so now I'm just gonna explain to you guys how exactly we end up with UFOs from these things, some of the kind of perceptual factors that come into play. How do we turn a fireball or a reentry into seeing cigar-shaped craft? Uh, and so Eddie Ballard, who is a phenomenal researcher, folklorist, has has this to say kind of about perceptual errors. Mm -hmm. When the eye plays tricks, UFOs may result. Autokinesis refers to illusory movements of stationary objects like a star or planet when viewed against a dark sky. So this is like when you're out at night and you're looking at a star and it looks like it's moving around, right? But it's not moving around. That's that's you. Uh, and we have contra contrast effects result when a bright light appears to darken the surrounding background and dims or drowns out the stars as if they seem to be occluded by a mass, right? So like people report like Phoenix lights, for example, like the 
there was just like this black like area we couldn't see the stars through it this could be a contrast effect the stars are there it's just that you're getting a distorted view of intensity because of contrast illusions yeah and somebody mentioned in the live chat that after a certain distance you don't have proper depth perception yep so that could be uh, an attribution or or a an explanation for why people sometimes are really seeing a group of flares, but they think there's a solid craft in the middle because they don't see stars in the middle of the uh, the, the flare display, basically. Yep. And 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 you also so the one that ends up happening also is uh, so that's your contrast effect. Now now we have when the eye connects separate objects into a single perceived form, the result is a contour illusion. And this is where your your mind naturally creates these shapes, right? Like you see three lights, so you create a triangle out of it. Like your mind naturally tries to fill in the blanks and create shapes and contours of things that aren't necessarily there. And so when you have several lights in the night sky, a combination of things like contour illusions and contrast effects can combine to create the appearance of a dark body with lights that are surrounding it, uh, with lights attached. A more complex illusion uh, is, you know, pareidolia, uh, which is the tendency to see random forms as meaningful objects, uh, like faces in the clouds, man in the moon, faces in the Mars. In these cases, your perception is true, but it's true as seen, but it's a deception. It doesn't accurately represent what is being shown to you. So in the case of Cosmos 1068 and these other kind of fireball and rancher cases, the train of burning debris produces an interesting illusion effect, which is known to psychologists. The isolated bits get connected up by several witnesses and interpreted as bright windows along the edge of a dark body craft. These sketches filled in the unseen body and so enhance the cigar or cylinder. But the most common description of this effect is that they look like an object is like a railway carriage in the sky. And there's mm -hmm. you know, quite a few famous cases of, about that. There's one in McAllister, Oklahoma in January 26, 1899, where people outside an opera house were watching an airship that they described as like a railway car suspended from a large balloon-like arrangement as it passed overhead. They said it shined a bright searchlight on the ground. This has become known as the airship effect because over the years, observers worldwide had consistently reported a particular type of non-existent windowed aircraft because the same fundamental psychological and cultural factors involved don't change that is the perceptual processes that your body and your mind and brain uses that out of play and the basic idea of a vehicle with windows or portholes or exposure to the same stimulus which can be space junk re-entry or fireball or meteor entry can repeatedly cause precisely the same type of misinterpretations the details may change slightly depending on the cultural factors at play at the time so people saw airships in the 19th century or cigar shaped craft or disc in the modern ufo era but for the most part the processes at play are fundamentally the same. But you, you, might, you might wonder then like, well, but still how can people confuse this? Like fireballs, they're really fast, right? Like they should just burn up and we, we won't even see them for more than, you know, just a few seconds. You can't confuse that for a UFO, right? I don't so know, I saw, I at the cap, I have a cabin that's in a super high elevation. Yeah. And it's amazing sometimes you see a meteor and i swear i haven't timed it but it's like in the sky for five minutes it's not like just a quick flash like a shooting star and that's that's actually true because what what you're actually seeing isn't at really per se the the meteor it's the meteor trail it's the luminous contrail uh the meteor is just the thing at the tip as it goes to the sky basically like like and and so this is i actually mentioned that here so so and george orbelt says that meteors basically enter at 12 to 72 kilometers a second which is pretty fast right seems to make seems to make it clear it'd be impossible that they can last very long in the sky but good old jalen Hynek points out to us that they can however produce these luminous trains they're similar to airplane contrails but quite different in origin and they can persist for several minutes these light contrails remain stationary until they fade out, but they can't change or reverse direction. So interesting. So people do, you know, they, they, uh, these trains can stay in the sky for like several minutes. And that's, that's what a lot of people are seeing when they see, uh, 
persistent meteors or whatever that you might call them. And there's, uh, you know, several major cases that kind of, you know, there's a fireball case in Utica where it was kind of reported as a UFO and it actually ended up in a Life magazine article on UFOs, but, you know, it, it was just a, a meteorite and they actually had a photo of it for comparison, which was kind of cool. Um, so now does this mean like all cigar shaped UFOs are caused by meteors or like re-entering space debris? Absolutely not. I mean, it, it, it doesn't mean that's the explanation for every case. You have to look at every case on its own merits, analyzing the data you have. But it does mean you have to give serious consideration as that's a potential explanation when you see a report that kind of describes something as like a cigar shape like this with lights. Because it's happened in so many cases. Yukon, before the aerial school incident in Zimbabwe, there was a, a reentry event that people drew. Uh, so when you can start to recognize these things and people report these again, you can get an idea that maybe that's what it was and you can maybe go look to see if a meteor happened. Which kind of gets into the discussion here on like, why, why do we even talk about like IFOs? Like, why do we even care if it's not a spaceship, right? Like, we should just move on and not talk or about a genuine, it. Or a genuine mystery. But I think those- Yeah, or a genuine mystery. I think those cases, Jeff, where things do get identified help educate and inform us on other cases that still are a mystery. As to, well, there, here's some possibilities that we can explore about this one that isn't explained. We can find one that was identified that is very similar to an unexplained case and maybe go down that road, route investigating it, right? Yeah, and and so like like one example, right, is like, like the Charles Witted sighting, which was it, a classic UFO case, right? Like it, it convinced many people that UFOs, like people in the government supposedly, that UFOs were extraterrestrial. Like it I apparently impressed Rupel and various other people. And they thought this was like a true legit case, right? It, it wasn't until, you know, 1968 when there was the Zon 4 reentry and they got all these sketches that people did of the Zon 4 reentry that they were able to go back and look at that case again with new eyes, fresh eyes, and determine it was a meteor. It was just a fireball. And if you actually look at the news reports at that that night in the area, there was many fireball reports in the media coverage. And but they didn't know that, right? Like you can't blame, you can't say like, oh, well, they did a crappy job investigating back in 1948. They just didn't have that knowledge at the time. Sure. Yeah. You can't it wasn't until that. 20 years later that they recognized this airship effect that allowed them to then go back and learn or maybe re-examine some of these old kind of cases. So, yeah, it's uh, uh, and you're absolutely right. Like the learning from them is absolutely what we can learn from IFOs. And that kind of just gets me to the last last part here. Uh, Jenny Randall's uh, wrote this excellent kind of article on how you can learn from IFO cases in the International UFO Reporter called the case for the IFO. Uh, and she gives a great example, but I just want to briefly go over the different uh, stages of the reporting process as she defines them. And so when you have a UFO, a UFO case, she presents these four stages. You have the event and that's your original stimulus. This is basically like what what kicked things off, right? It could be Venus, it could be the moon, it could be an extraterrestrial spaceship, like it could be a plane. This is what they saw in the sky, it, and that's so it was objectively real, right? Like like I say, most people aren't hoaxing; they're not faking. There was something that kicked off the sighting. It's it's later on that it gets a bit distorted. That's where you get to stage two. Stage two is their subjective experience of the event. It's how they take that event, whatever it may be, and turn it into their what they experienced, how they experienced it as a UFO event in the first place, how they kind of conceptualized it as being a UFO sighting. The third stage then is their account of the event. That's basically their witness testimony. That's what they tell to like an investigator or the media. That's them reciting their sighting. That's their personal narrative of their experience. The fourth stage is your UFO report. And this is your, your final report. This is like what 
MUFON or some UFO group would put out or an investigator would put out that that gets shared in the UFO community and then gets repeated in, in books and media and all that stuff. So she uses a great example. She had received this uh, relatively unremarkable report of a bright light seen by a couple on a frosty December morning. Uh, she received the report just within a few hours of the sighting. And despite them using some pretty extreme language, she was able uh, to determine that the couple saw Venus. Then the media got involved with the story. They talked to a local newspaper and, uh, and it gave a television interview describing their account. Now the media wanted a UFO story. Randalls informed the media ahead of time that it was Venus, but they were not interested in the facts. They wanted a UFO story. The witnesses know the media is looking for a good story. So within 24 hours, the couple's account started to deviate pretty significantly from how they originally reported it to Randalls. They elaborated on what they had originally told her, and now a firm shape had been seen, and they were contemplating that it had potentially landed. Now, any UFO investigator that comes onto the seen at that point hoping to investigate this case and figure out what it was might have a pretty difficult time doing it with all this new conflicting information that is so distorted from the original testimony but a ufo investigator group did in fact come onto the scene at this point uh they interviewed the witnesses they showed them photos of ufos and they asked them to choose what the ufo looked like now this is not the best idea right so so what yeah. photo Pick out of the lineup, a George Adamski saucer photo. So they pick out this George Adamski saucer photo. The UFO group ends up writing a report of their investigation in which they suggest that this strange craft not only landed next to the couple's house, it's potentially an abduction involved. Uh, and so, and here Jerry, Jenny Randalls was quietly observing this whole process take place through all the different stages of this UFO report process. And she would end up saying she learned more from this one IFO case than hundreds of cases that, you know, remained unsolved. And she began to look more carefully uh, at uh, IFO cases and the number, uh, and she became more concerned with how many extreme UFO accounts have been generated from witnesses that really, when the event was something totally mundane, like the observation of the moon. And so many cases from like the giant Yukon UFO, Charles Witted, cases that were considered top 10 cases, classic cases that have turned out to just have the most prosaic mundane explanations. Like and, Venus. Like it's yeah, like Venus, down right? from like going from like, oh, it might have landed and it might have did this and it might have did that. And then it turns out, well, it was just Venus. Yeah. So there's no Venus landing on the planet Earth. So that blows, yeah. <laughs> blows to shit, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you you have that's, someone that's that when you get to the big letdown. I've talked about this. It's overhype, over sensationalized, and inevitably you're going to under deliver, which leads to the big letdown when when yep. you finally know what the truth is of the case. Yeah, and and this is why it's important. Uh, it points to the urgency of investigating cases quickly. Like even just the the passages of hours can seriously reduce like the evidential value of the testimony. And problems only increase like as time gets further away from when the event happened. Mm -hmm. When we can get to like a witness as reasonably soon, as soon as as to when the event happened as possible, we're more likely to actually learn what really happened and to be able to properly investigate it. And it's also important as to why when we need to learn from these past like case histories and so we can use them to like potentially look for solutions of UFO reports in the future. And we need to learn about all these like factors at play between the sighting event, which is could be totally mundane, the stimulus, and the report that is shared and repeated in the UFO community through books, films, TV, social media, lectures, and other outlets. I've said this many times, but this is why it's so important to go look at the primary source material for a case to find the material of the case that is as close to possible as to when the event actually happened. Because by the time the UFO story hits the book page, it's been copied and pasted and recycled and modified. And the, the narrative you're being told telephone. A, yeah, it, telephone it's game. so substantially different than the actual <laughs> account that it's almost worthless, right? Like, like if you look at Eddie Ballard uses an example of the Phoenix Lights, which people love that case, right? But 
if you actually look at the original witness testimony, like as he points out, it's vastly it's, different from the, yeah, from the it's end, utterly yeah. unremarkable. Like it's not like he doesn't even think it's a UFO case. Like, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, you know, the, the things get really distorted and changed. And that's why you need to, if you're an investigator, you need to get hopefully the original testimony before they've been manipulated by the media or other investigators. Like if you're investigating a case later on, you need to find the first place the cases were mentioned, you know, like either the first time they were interviewed or if they filed a report somewhere, like don't trust the book you got that, that, that just got that story from another UFO book that got that story from another UFO book. And they all got the date and place wrong and they've been copying and pasting it three or four times down the line. So you got to look at the original material. Uh, just to, uh, this is pretty much the end of the slides that I prepared. There's the, I read three really good chapters of this book, which I can't like speak highly enough about. It came out last year and it's available online in PDF for free. Uh, so you don't even have to pay for it. Uh, I recommend reading these three chapters. Uh, they're not very long. They don't even take very long. Uh, the first was James Oberg, which some people may know as a skeptic, uh, a UFO skeptic. He worked for NASA. He wrote a great chapter on the misinterpretation of fireball swarms from satellite reentries. That one of my slides earlier was from that. Uh, the next was a great chapter called UFOs, the role of perceptual illusions and the endurance of an empirical myth by Manuel Borez Amrit. And lastly, and this is one I leaned on super heavily, was Eddie Ballard or Thomas Ballard's Calibrating the Instrument, How Reliable is Eyewitness Testimony? And it's really important to learn about this stuff, right? Like so many people. Oh, I agree. I agree. Because so many people like just are like, oh, yeah. Here. Like yeah. you're you're a debunker if you don't like no this got nothing to do with debunking right like like Eddie Ballard like I've had people when I've tried to share this call him a debunker skeptic like like he Ballard's not a skeptic right he's a folklorist like and he's like pretty far away from a skeptic like but any serious investigator that is concerned with truth and not perpetuating the mystery you know like despite possible prosaic explanations needs to know about how human perception works they need to know how memory works how the process how how your brain isn't like a it's not like a computer you're not recording like a file right like, mm -hmm. like and, and your memory isn't stationary either it, it's constantly reconsolidated and it's constantly taking in new information from you know uh the public new information you get from the media and so if you have a ufo sighting and you're watching coverage about UFOs in the media, you start to adjust your sighting to kind of fit the, to fit kind of everyone else's, right? And so there's, you, you need to understand all these processes that come into play all along that report stage. You need to understand all the kind of visual illusions and that come into play that can affect UFO sightings. Because it's not that we're saying nothing happened. You're not calling people crazy. You're not saying they're hallucinating. Yeah, and then our real a lot, of, a lot of this stuff actors. is some some people just get me. I have somebody that emails me constantly, um, really grainy, shitty. Uh, well, I, I don't want to say shitty. I'm sorry. He he emails me really low quality uh, pictures that is are essentially a point of light in the sky, and. Uh, you know, so I, I, and he's insisting these are alien spaceships. And so this is a mothership. And I started saying, give me the date and location of the time and your general GPS coordinates. And then we look on a satellite tracker and, and it turns out that everything he's sending me is a satellite, you know, but he's convinced. So I agree with you. You have to take all these things into consideration and you have to eliminate prosaic explanations. And you also, you have to question witness testimony. You can't just believe that that person's perception is 100% spot on exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Because of all the reasons you mentioned, people's memories are different, their, their perception of time. I always love when you ask a person that has zero experience in like aeronautics or aircraft, how big was the craft? You know, like, how, how do you know that they're accurate that it was 50 feet wide if they're looking at it and it's miles away from them? How are they estimating? How, you know, so I agree with you. You have to really Which question. Why, be like, skeptical. Yeah. Yeah. This is why Jenny Randall's actually points out, like, it's 
she thinks it's it's pointless. In fact, it's bad to ask questions like that on her forum. Like you shouldn't be asking it about size and distance because people are, are incapable of actually determining that stuff. Like at best, they could tell you at what angle in the sky it was and perhaps like the angle of separation of, you know, like that, that way you can start to, if you have reference points, protect, potentially calculate like distances and sizes and things like that. But actually like telling somebody like, so when somebody says, oh, it's 200 feet, like you, you can't really put a whole lot of credit into what people say as far as both like distances or, or how fast they think it's going or how far away it is or this. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, I, I'd mentioned on the other show that there is a guy, a British intelligence officer, R.V. Jones, who actually was involved in UFO investigations for the British government. Um, he, he he talked about intelligence and like human, the process of human intelligence. And he's like, you can pretty much when you get human intelligence from someone, you can pretty much be sure something happened at that place at roughly that time. But that's about all, you know, like the, the other details you're not so sure about. Right. Like, so something did happen. There was some, some event, but the rest of the details you've got to, you know, call in the question or, you know, think about critically and see if you can actually demonstrate if they're true or not. And, and yeah. none of this says that you think it's all, all bunk, right? Like you, you need to be able to know all this stuff just to be able to like, you know, find the real mysteries, the stuff that you can't explain in this, in these ways, but we need to get rid of the bunk, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the stuff that can be explained. So. I can't agree with you more. So uh, that that's it for your presentation. That's great. Uh, yeah, historical that's, that's look at some it. of this stuff. Yeah, pretty much it here. Just this little cartoon. No defense. <laughs> no, madam. It was just a Russian rocket breaking up on entry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we, we're gonna kill the screen share then, right? Yeah. Cool, cool, yeah, cool. and now since you've given us a look at the past, I thought we'd talk about some of the things in the present. I don't want to keep you too long, um, but uh, we do have uh, some. You know, I think there's some. There has been some pretty interesting things happen in the past year, um, especially with regard to governmental, I guess, uh, action or investigation into these things. And so uh, I guess I, I wanted to start asking you about Grush because, um, you know, I've been very critical and I've taken a lot of hits. God forbid that you ask somebody for evidence, but we're in position right now um, with Dave Grush, wherein he, it's been 304 days now since he made his original um his original, his original claims. It's been 304 days making huge claims and zero evidence shown so far. <laughs> what was that? My mouse and my... Something blew up? What did somebody tell me about that earlier? That you never know what's going to blow up while Jeff is on a live stream. Oh, because I, I, I had like... Uh... A microwave that kind of blew up on me and uh and, oh and then i accidentally turned on the burner uh the wrong burner on my stove that had a glass pyrex pan on it and that shattered and exploded glass into three rooms around the house <laughs> you're, <laughs> a, you're a dangerous guest mr jeff knox but let, let's get into this grush situation so for those unaware they the media the people selling this story, by the way, they've made hundreds of thousands of dollars off of his evidence-free claims in monetized views. People like to argue with me, but you know, if you could do first grade math, you can add up the millions of views on YouTube, the millions of monetized downloadable podcasts about him and all those other things. And you can quickly and easily get to hundreds of thousands of dollars in money generated. And we're at 304 days of him making these fantastic claims for those unaware of course he claimed the government's in possession of alien spaceships alien bodies or non-human they, they'd like to return things for some reason might be interdimensional we don't know if they're alien so these Not huge claims yeah made it all the way to congress what do you think he's ever going to show any evidence or has this been the biggest bluff in ufo history after all you're a historian 
There's been some big bluffs in UFO history. Is this the biggest? I, I think it is. My opinion is this is the biggest UFO bluff in history. I mean, it's certainly as far as like people. I mean, there's been a lot of people that make claims. Not a lot of them made their way to Congress, like as as small of a little dealy as that was. But not a lot of them still made their way to Congress to be able to tell their stories. As, as far as like, you know, again, what he was supposed to have a op-ed in March, right? It's now April. Where's the op-ed? No op-ed. <laughs> I and thought it was supposed to be originally supposed to be in January. Or maybe it was. Yeah, the, they you keep moving keep, the goalpost. Yeah. Well, you know, it, when you Lou all's on a two point you got to follow the same playbook. You push the date repeatedly, just like the book. You know, you push. Yeah, your three years ago, he goal. announced the book deal. Three years ago, the publisher of Lou Alzando's book announced signing him for a book deal. We're still waiting on the book. I, I don't know about you, but I think Lou, November maybe. Yeah, I think Lou Elizondo is waiting. He's trying. In my, this is just my opinion and speculation, Jeff. He's trying to figure out how far out on a limb can he go lying without risking some sort of legal trouble, because you can't you can't make completely and totally factually false statements to sell a book. Like if if I say I worked at the Pentagon running a UFO program and I and I use that to market a book and I never worked at the you know but in his case it's murkier because yes he worked at the Pentagon Nick but he's never been doing that for decades man what yeah he's, well uh, there's people that are filing consumer protection complaints against did you know this this is interesting yeah there are there are people that are filing consumer protection agency complaints against Nick Pope in states that he appears in and does public appearances because he claims that he ran a British UFO program and the, the British government have released several confirmations that he never ran a UFO program for the British government. Yeah. So people say that's a form of consumer fraud. People are filing consumer protection complaints against him. You know? What, what if... What if Lou saw the game that Nick Pope was playing, you know, that you could play a play a former government UFO investigator and, yeah. and the career that Nick Pope developed out of it and figured, hey, I could do that myself. It's very likely because they're they're basically the same thing. They're two guys who both did work for the government, but in both their cases, they had no assigned responsibilities. Yeah. As far as UFOs go, they didn't run a UFO program like they both claim. There and may be yeah. some vague connection to yeah. UFO files, but they had no actual role. And and yeah, yeah. I think his book. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if he keeps pushing it because he knows it's gonna be a bomb. Like, like what? Like it's been so hyped for so many years. Like people literally think it's like gonna be like the new version of the bible right it's gonna like be the disclosure <laughs> i think like he realizes it's gonna be of nothing well there could <laughs> also i keep meaning i think that journalist uh art levine shout out to journalist art levine from the washington spectator i think that he I, i'm and by the way i could be completely wrong about this i have to check in with him i haven't in a while but i think that he's going to the publisher the original announced publisher and asking some questions like where's the book do, are you aware of these, uh, you know, statements from the government refuting what you're using to market the book with? This is going to be a problem. And I have said that if he does market that book saying I ran a government UFO program, I'm going to start filing consumer protection or I'm going to start at least calling consumer protection agencies in the states the book is being sold in and ask why is he allowed to lie to people to sell a book? Isn't I think that that's wrong. Doing on his website, yeah, his website is basically making the same false Promoting claims the as the UFO guy that worked for the government for however many eight years or whatever doing investigate. Yeah, it's yeah, and and he's he's kind of to be very honest, Jeff. I think he's in a bad situation because I know there are people like Stephen Greenstreet who have clips of him at public events saying I ran a twenty-two million dollar funded UFO program. That's going to be a problem for him because all the government disputes that. And, you know, I just I, I, I don't understand. Isn't it interesting, though, Jeff, you know a lot about UFO history and so do I. But you certainly are, are much better at it than me. All of these UFO guys, there's always some big major flaw 
right? Like Nick Pope sounds great. You ran a British UFO program. Wow. Let's listen. He's this guy probably knows a lot about UFOs, but then you yeah. find out he never ran a British UFO program. You've got Lou Elizondo. Oh, I ran a Pentagon program. Then you find out he never did. You got Bob Lazar. I'm a former government scientist. Then you find out he's a convicted pimp and a fake scientist imposter. Like yep. there's so many of these guys that have this fatal flaw. It almost appears to me, and some people have speculated about this, that some of these people are like intentionally like that. So that if you need to bust them, you know, as fake, you can, because they have that fatal flaw built into their, to their shit somehow. It's bizarre. Or may maybe it's just that like normal sane people don't pretend to be fake government UFO scientists. <laughs> place like i love he, his followers get so pissed at me jeff i call him the the pentagon ufo program from the land of make believe and they lose their and isn't it interesting no matter how much proof comes out that he never had assigned responsibilities he didn't run a funded program some of his some of his true believer followers still argue with you it's like here it is in black and white. Yeah. Here it is in black and white from the Aero report. The government has issued several statements, and they still want to argue with you that he did. Well, like, even Lou himself like has been caught just saying contradictory crap on Twitter, right? Like he'll say again, like you said, that he's ran this program, and then he'll then there's a tweet of him saying, "I never said I actually worked for a tip or ran a tip or or did Austin." Like he says contradictory stuff, and yeah, he I've said actually, he uh, said he tweeted once, "I had absolutely nothing to do with OSAP." Yeah. Then he claimed he did later. He, yep, then exactly. he claimed, "Oh, I was the security officer for OSAP." So you're right. There's all these contradictory statements, and I predict that 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 book is going to be the biggest nothing burger UFO book in human history. That's my prediction. That's just my take on it, my yeah. opinion. Because he's had six years. What information could he have held for six years that now he's going to put it in the book? I think we're going to get a lot of – I think what we're going to get a lot of is shit that anybody can find on the internet and a lot of philosophical ramblings. What do you think about what may be in, in his book? Because he doesn't have any insider information, that's for sure. He has what he learned basically going around on that TV show, you know, talking to wackadoos in Italy and other people, <laughs> feeding yeah. him stories like the fake Italy hoax case. Like, yeah. I, I, you know, so I met Lou back in the, uh, let's see, when was the first time I met him? 20, 2018 was uh, his very first event, right? That MUFON symposium uh, in Cherry Hill. Where he was supposed to do this whole like thing, but he basically con artist that he is bailed out, took the free vacation for his family that came with him, and bailed out and didn't do the the events that he was supposed to do. But I had the opportunity to see him at the state director meeting because uh, I was basically uh, taking the place of the guy that couldn't come for Oregon, and he came back there and again. Yeah, he gave that whole speech. You know, I ran the government investigation program for UFOs for all this time. Like I had the chance to meet him at the first SCU event, like as well. And like each time I've talked to the guy, like he, he, he says outright, I don't know anything about UFOs. Like, it's like, I'm not a UFO guy. Right. Like, I don't really know anything about this topic or the history of this topic, but yet he's consistently put out as like the leading expert on UFOs. Like he's on called himself in one of those yeah. book postings, the world's leading expert on the UAP UFO phenomenon. When he's been very explicit, he doesn't know crap about UFOs in the past. Like, like I don't think he really knew much about UFOs when he came out as this guy, like, you know, in 2017. I think he learned a lot of this stuff when they started to film that TV show and they started to tell him all those cases, you know, that they presented in the UFOs investigation, unknown or whatever that show was called. Uh, I think he learned a lot of this stuff from that because those are the cases you'll, you'll see him and Chris Mellon, you know, and, and David Grush. They're the same cases these guys will go and repeat in mm -hmm. podcasts and other shows. The same shows that people like Lou. Yeah, the only evidence, the shows. only evidence whatsoever, if you could call it evidence, that Grush put forth was the completely busted fake Mussolini UFO case. And as soon as you know William Brophy is involved, who was also involved in the Trinity UFO hoax. Yep you know that that's a fake case or at least it's one of those cases there might be a nugget of truth to it but then all of the 
add-ons. They keep adding on to it. First, it was just they recovered a, a UFO well, in Mussolini's Italy. Then it was there's a Vatican conspiracy and they got bodies and they flew them back to Wright Patterson. And that all was tacked on by William Brophy, a known UFO yep. scammer. So as soon as I heard Grush talk about that case, I knew, number one, in my opinion, he got that from Lou Elizondo, who hung out with the promoters of that case in Italy a few yeah, years prior. And then two, that that Grush is full of shit because he can't he doesn't even know. You're right. These guys, maybe they're right. They don't know anything about UFOs or history. They haven't done any research. They just somebody gives them this information. And if they appear credible, they say, oh, this is a real case. And then they repeat it. It's it's ridiculous. I think a lot of those guys, like I said, like Mellon and Lou, like were actually kind of they were told about various UFO cases from various UFO researchers and investigators over the last several years. That stuff kind of ended up trickling to Grush and other people. And and then with Grush, you know, he told that he told the Milan story, the, the Italy crash and that was just total bunk but then you would see him in later podcast start to talk about other things and you could tell he was just learning from ufo books right like he'd mention yeah, reading the quoting ufo jacques, books he's quoting jacques valet books yeah or, or the ufo how put off stories or yeah, the ufo or, or, stories yeah yeah and yeah, so you can just, tell this guy is clearly just learning as he goes like even in just the last 300 days right like he's just reading the same books we all have and then he goes on these shows and he talks about these stories. And then people presume because they believe he was this whistleblower that the knowledge he has is coming from like real insider stuff, right? Like from inside the government. And they're not understanding that he's actually just passing on stuff from the UFO literature that like we've all he's, read. Yeah, he's, or, just, he's just parroting the same old information. Yeah. And they yeah. don't, and so many people don't get that because, of course, like, you know, it's just repackaged, people, right? He's just really tell you that. Yeah. yeah, he's just repackaging it with uh, an impressive resume behind him. Oh, I worked yep. for the geospatial or I was an intelligence officer. And isn't it interesting that he also spent some time, David Grush, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but a, 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 an Internet sleuth that is smarter than me went through that picture of him with all of his medals and ribbons. And, and one of the things that I think is incredibly interesting is that he worked in information warfare for a time. Yeah, I don't know. And so I did know. and so did Anjali. So we've got two information war spare specialists coming into the UFO community telling UFO stories. That's a little suspicious to me. Yeah. And and this is, you know, I kind of I kind of uh agree with the the arrow kind of report here is that you kind of have this like community of people that work for the government is kind of like a, a classified rumor mill you know all these guys like these these sri put off like guys you know like these you know osep like guys and that go all the way back to like you know sri and the other paranormal crap in the 70s all these guys have just been like telling each other the same stories around the water cooler you know for the last 40 years and you get somebody i think like like grash that comes along and he sees these people that are like you know, I guess respected individuals with clearances that have been in the game for a long time. And they're telling stories about crash ships and all this stuff. And you think, hey, that's credibility there. There's something to it. And you start to believe that, you know, there's facts there when really all those guys, are, again, are just telling stories, stories that have been going around forever. And you just like didn't get that. Like, yeah, so like, this is nothing like, new. Yeah. This rush yeah. is nothing new. He's just repackaging the nothing. same old yeah. stories. Same old yeah. stories. Like I can't think of anything Gresh has presented that is original whatsoever. And and I as far as will he ever present proof, I doubt it. Like yeah. I think he would have by now. Like I don't think yeah. he has like anything. We have to take a moment to thank two kind and generous benefactors, Jeff. Uh Chuck Bam with Praise kind and generous dollar ninety nine super sticker. Praise the cash and Thomas Robinson with a kind and generous three pound. For those unaware, we read every single super chat, but sometimes when we have an excellent guest like Jeff, I, I don't want to interrupt the presentation to praise the cash. So I'm sorry, we, we wait till the end of them, but we'll read any uh, any others that people throw in. If you're feeling generous and want to help us to praise the cash, praise the cash, praise the cash. Praise the cash, Jeff. <laughs> you could be the new cash clown. Don't let my son see that. Do you know he 
he uh, he he uh, he's interesting. He he like hit me up. He thinks he should get a percentage every time I use the bumper. I think he must have been reading about royalties or something. You know, he's got himself a, a an intellectual property lawyer. Yeah, my wife he's thinks he's going to be a lawyer because he's talking. He's also talking about contracts. He's like, I should have a contract to do the cash clown stuff, Dad. <laughs> So uh, uh, the Arrow report, we haven't we we've touched on Lou Elizondo and Dave Grush. I agree with you. We did a, a you like UFO history. I did a historical look at all of these UFO crash cases, and not a one of them had any evidence. Many of them were hoaxes. So you know, I think history is our greatest teacher. I don't think Grush is ever going to come through with any real or verifiable evidence of non-human intelligence or aliens yeah. or anything like that. And in fact, I think that Stephen Greenstreet and others, maybe John from the Black Vault, I've pointed it out. He's in that same circle. You you mentioned Lou Elizondo 2.0. Grush is in the same circle of people that brought us TTSA and Lou Elizondo and it's incredibly suspicious. It's like, it's like Eric Davis's SSO or something. Like, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. And yeah, it's yeah. interesting because we have the same. People. So it's the same group of people that were surrounding Elizondo, who turned out to be a fake Pentagon UFO program director with no real evidence or insider knowledge, though. They all like to play, Jeff, that they have this insider knowledge. You, you ever notice that? They're always like, oh, I can't say anymore. Or, I have to be careful what I, I say. I got an here. NDA that I had to sign. Uh, yes. And then Arrow <laughs> pointed out that there's no UAP specific NDAs. None. There is none. Yeah. But then, so, so we've talked about Elizondo. We've talked about Grush. I don't want to keep you for too long. But just on this Arrow report, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on it because I, I, when I read this Arrow report, I was like, oh, my God, this is devastating to that group. The Hal Putoffs, the Eric Davis, the Lou Elizondos, the Dave Grushes, the Stephen Greers mentioned in there. You know, that report was essentially the government calling – Is my perception of that report was – that the government is getting tired of these wackadoos and they literally call bullshit on these people that have no evidence. What yeah. was your perception of the report? And what do you think the effect is going to be on some of that group of uh, the grifter squad wackadoos? Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's really like a couple of ways to look at this report. Uh, you know, as a historian, there's obviously some issues with it as far as like, you know, what they cover, like, you know, they get some details wrong, like some pretty like shocking details. Like yeah, they should have hired you. Yeah. For the historical or, or, or part. Right? Anyway, like, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, like the Kenneth Arnold sighting, they got wrong by like a day. Uh, and you know, so there's, there's minor details wrong as far as like, like this, some of the historical details go. And a lot of people were also kind of disappointed in just like the length of it. You know, it's only 60 something pages or whatever it is. Yeah. And, and many of those pages are just cited sources. So. Yeah. And it's a pretty crappy citation list to like classified, classified or, or just, it, the, I mean, it's, that's kind of laughable. And, but, you know, I, I didn't have as much expectations as a lot of people did. A lot of people thought this report was going to be like, kind of like an encyclopedia right of the ufo topic for, from 1945 to now like like yeah, and then it's only 60 pages it's a bit of yeah. a letdown if you're in, it's it's, like, yeah it wasn't a report on the history of the ufo topic it's a report on the records of the ufo topic and that's kind of what they did like they pointed out the different times the government investigated ufo sightings and what what's in the record, which is kind of similar to what the NASA UAP little project did. They weren't actually studying UFOs. They were studying what data was out there and available and how it could be analyzed and looked at. Mm -hmm. And so from a historical perspective, it's lacking. You know, they get details wrong. I think they get some of the I think they do a, a decent job of going through the different investigative bodies. Yeah, and, and it was like a just a big, huge, condensed summary of yeah, it's, UFOs. It's basically like a summary. It, it, yeah, it's just a summary of the various efforts the government did and some of the various projects that could be confused for UFOs. So that's kind of like the historical part. So it, it could have been better. I think they should have hired a historian to write something like the Roswell report. That was, you know, a big fatty phone book size sucker. Uh, they could have done that. But, but where this part really actually shines... And to be honest, it's really all people cared about anyways, because as 
like as much as I love the history, the vast majority of the community doesn't really give a crap about the history of this topic. Well, they wanted to know about the alien bodies, the craft spaceships, and if there's any truth to the stuff Grush is saying. And that's where this report shines. If it fails historically, it shines is that it kind of explains what I also have believed was kind of going on here, that you kind of have a rumor mill going on of certain individuals perpetuating the stories that in some cases it was people honestly confusing real secret programs that just had nothing to do with UAPs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a bit of an honest misperception. And I think that could also be going on with Grush. I think it certainly obviously was the case with some of his witnesses that were mistaking perhaps a real classified program. And it's understandable because of compartmentalization, if you're given a piece of metal and told to analyze it, you know, and they don't tell you where it comes from, maybe you think it's from an alien spaceship when really it's from a new Russian drone that they recovered, you know, in the Republic of Georgia after, a, you know, whatever. Uh, so it's, it, it, you can see how people might be mistaken when they work for a very classified program, they aren't told anything and they're given a piece of metal to analyze. And that turns into being a UAP program. And I think they looked at, the witnesses that went to them and they found no evidence of these programs. They found people were either mistaken or they couldn't provide any evidence to support their claims. And I think it really excelled in that. And I think these people that are telling a different story, these people that are calling arrow liars, you know, they're saying this, they're liars. This report is a bogus. It's debunking garbage, like prove they're lying. Yeah, and isn't it interesting, Jeff, they can prove Kirkpatrick and the government liars. How awesome would it be if somebody did prove that they lied and covered up real proof of alien visitation or whatever? It would be awesome. Yeah. But the, all these people have is nothing burger stories. They don't have any empirical or real or verifiable evidence. They have stories. So they, yep. of course, they run to the cover-up excuse. I predicted that that's what they were going to do. And by yep. the way, uh, Mr. Knox, I don't know if you know, but I predicted how devastating this report was going to be because a little birdie told me about some of the things that were going to be included in the report. And I, I didn't know if that source was accurate, but they were 100% accurate. I got, uh, you know, tipped off of, of Shortly before, well, let's, let's the be honest. Was you don't need reported. to be Norkadamus to know that this report was going to be a disappointment to everyone. <laughs> I think every, anyone yeah. with half a brain could have predicted that uh, outcome, but uh, that's that's your apology for you. It's one continual letdown after another, you know, one well, continual letdown. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think. Yeah, you know, they I think they laid the gauntlet down here and said, like, you know, we found nothing with any of you guys. So the right response is if any of these guys have anything, lay it down. They 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 just said there's no evidence of this. If you have proof, then just drop it. Like prove the government wrong. Like I honestly I'm not sure there'd be consequences if they actually had it. But the problem is what these people think might be proof, again, might just be a classified program that has nothing to do with UAPs that they end up expo exposing. And this yeah, is part and, of and also, I, I always try to remind my audience that there is 100% verifiable proof and evidence of crash retrieval projects, moon dust yeah. and some of the others we've detailed here. If, if something comes down from a foreign adversary, they go get it and they take it somewhere and they rip it apart, just like the Chinese balloons. If they foreign get Chinese division. drones, yeah that goes to the foreign technology division. So it's easy to see that maybe some of these crash retrieval programs have been mistaken. They picked up Russian tech, they picked up Chinese tech, Indian tech, whatever. Russian re-entry, vehicles re-entering. If a satellite comes down, they go try to get it because they want to rip it apart. This is our enemies. We there want to see what in technology they have. So it's easy, right? They can mistake yeah. that. Like, they hear a story, oh, we picked up this thing and we don't know what it is. It must be alien. It's easy to see how these things can be conflated. So certainly, yeah, there's crash retrievals. They do it that. May Every a real spaceship. It may yeah. be a spaceship from space. It's just not a UFO spaceship from an alien. You but, know? It's, like, but it's not alien. It's yeah, human it's, made. It's a satellite that came down. You know, like I posted about a crash case, a uh, crash retrieval case in um, uh, somewhere in South America. And it, I think it, was good. it was a nuclear satellite. They were concerned about the nuclear debris. So they sent in like military to like retrieve like this object from the jungles of like, you know, South America. But it, it wasn't a UFO. It was a 
a satellite that they didn't want that n n nuclear material, you know, like getting out to whoever or potentially getting into the environment. So they sent out a team to get it. There was that famous case up in Canada uh, that basically dropped nuclear material over a widespread area of Canada. I, I remember that. Yeah. Ago. Yeah. And again, that there was there was a whole operation name for that, like White Snow or something like that. I forget what it was called, but it was the crash retrieval operation to like get the debris from that satellite that rained nuclear material over Canada. Yeah, like, so and that could be that's another one that could be easily mistaken for some kind of yeah. alien sighting. Like somebody sees a fireball in the sky, and then suddenly there's high radiation levels, and maybe an inexperienced investigator that doesn't know about that reentry. It's, you know, look, we've got radiation levels all over the area where, of the sighting. This must mm -hmm. be alien. It's easy to jump to the conclusions, right? Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And so I think there's a lot of that, a lot of that going on, that a lot of people are confused. And I just, uh, I haven't seen any evidence to support any of these these claims of crash retrievals or UAP programs. I would love to see it. I think they. Me should too. Yeah, it would be such it. a cooler world if that was true. You know, people yeah. get. I know you get the same stuff because you're le like level-headed and grounded and skeptical, and you don't jump to aliens. That's one of the reasons that we get along, you and me, Mister Knox. But the the fact that so many people jump straight to aliens and then they get angry at me. Like, look, I would love it. If we found out that there was alien visitation on Earth, I would be jubilant. I would be so, and I don't yeah. even know why. I don't even know why. Uh, you know, maybe because I'd feel they less alone. To wipe us out. I'll still yeah. be. Yeah, I'll we'll still be like, woo, aliens. But I would love it because it, that's the thing, though, Mr. Knox. The world, the truth is boring. It's like we said, like, you know, if it's just a meteor, that's boring, but hey, what if it's an alien spacecraft visiting Earth? It would be a much cooler world. So these the, myst the mysterious cases, like some of them that you post on your Twitter every day, those are the cases that interest me and keep me interested in the genuine mystery of this thing. Yeah, and and personally, I'm also just interested in, and even if none of those cases have some truly mysterious explanation, like. I find it interesting the mysterious way in which like we create these narratives, the way we perceive things. Like I'm fascinated by like the human brain and the like the psychology and the sociology that goes on to comes into this like topic and into UFO reports. And like it's it's all really interesting to me. Like that's why I'm interested in the people as well and why I'm interested in like studying UFO religions and yeah. Like yeah, yeah, me too. I love a good I, listen, I have a compulsion besides UFO stuff. If I see something on cults anywhere, I watch it. I don't know what it is. It's just there's like the psychology of that stuff. Like, you know, like the Waco guy, David Koresh, mm -hmm. you know, like him telling his followers, like, listen, I had a conversation with God and he decided you can't bang your wife anymore. But I can, and then they they go along with it. It's fascinating to me that people yeah. go along with some stuff like that. Yeah. I love the cult stuff. The UFO cult stuff is interesting, and isn't it interesting, Mister Knox? Like people are saying stuff like, "Well, Lou, uh, David Grush testified before Congress, and they would arrest him if he lied." But then oh, I found the historical example of the Raelian UFO cult who lied through their teeth in front of Congress, telling Congress the that they. They cloned yep. the person, and then Congress passed legislation. So some of the UFO nutters tell me, well, Congress passed legislation based on David Grush's testimony. Well, we can show you in a historical example where they did that before based on UFO wackadoos testifying before Congress. That doesn't mean what the wackadoos said is 100% true, you know? They, you know, like, uh, it's an example. I use that they passed hundreds of, like, critical race theory laws based on bogus right-wing conspiracy theories all around the U.S. over the last several years made based on totally made-up fictions that this one spin doctor came up with. Like, they got laws passed all around the country, right? Like, this, you know, anyone can, you can get laws passed with the right, you know, kind of a promotion, PR work, and effort, you know. But the thing with Gresham and this whole, this narrative, like, like well, he'd be, test, he'd be, he'd be, you know, in big trouble for lying to Congress. They don't seem to understand, like, he could not be not he could it doesn't mean he's lying right like he can actually truly believe what he is saying yeah there's yeah. a difference between lying you cannot be lying and what you're saying still total bullshit 
Well, plus, you know, Jeff, uh, there are clear cut examples where 100 percent people have been caught lying to Congress and nobody gets prosecuted. That's yeah, number one, because that's another one of the whack do excuses. Oh, he he told the truth because they would prosecute him if he didn't. And then number two, he's not he is just recounting things people told him. Yeah. So even if it all turns out to be false, he could just say, this is what people told me. This is what I, you know, I, I was told and, and, and I repeated the information I was given. I believed it to be accurate at the time and he would get a pass. They're never going to prosecute him. Even if they find out he totally lied through his teeth, you know, look at the people that weapons of mass destruction testified for Congress. Come on. But, you know? but now people say, Gresh, though, but he does have firsthand information. Like, it's not just secondhand. It's like, yeah. Uh, and when he first came, that's a red flag to me because when he first came out, I don't have any firsthand information. And the media that around him was reporting, though he doesn't have any firsthand information, fast forward months later, suddenly he remembers he has firsthand information now, you know? So the story evolves as people lose. But then interest. you hear, First-hand information to his circle of friends, like Cold Heart, actually means like your cousin's brother told his uncle something. That's firsthand mm -hmm. because they heard it, you know. Or Danny God. Sheehan. I saw a picture of a UFO crash. Somebody showed me a picture and said it was a UFO crash. So I'm a first-hand witness. No, you're not. You saw a fucking picture, dude. Yeah, that, 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 that's the first thing I was like, wait a second. First-hand? No. Second all, <laughs> like, like. You didn't even see a UFO crash, dude. Like you made that story up later. The first time you told the story, there was no freaking UFO crash. Like, like you you changed your narrative between the '90s and now. Like as people do. Like I guess the original story, which is just that he saw a piece of metal in the file that had some writing on it. Like not a crash at a 45 degree angle with U.S. Air Force officers around it or whatever the hell else he was telling recently. Like. Mm -hmm. So he, he just totally rebuilt his story. Like, it's nonsense. Like, yeah, these, yeah, I don't know. Does it, does, does, and let me ask you a, a parting question. Does the amount of fraud, lying, scamming, does that really bother you as sort of a serious historical researcher? Because you have to get through all the, all the noise because it really bothers me, you know? Yeah, yeah I, I think it's, you know, it's, it bothers me because as somebody who's so interested and fascinated by this topic and that there's so much like history and stuff out there to learn about it, that people spend so much time with these, these grifters, these frauds, these people promoting bunk, like instead of actually learning about the, the fun and interesting stuff about the UFO topic, it's, these guys get an extraordinary amount of the attention and and the money, right? Like, like there's, you know, people say there's no money in UFOs, but as you point out, there, there's money. There's some money in UFOs, you know. Like you can say there's no money. There's no money for some people. There's no money for researchers like myself. There's money for these people. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Here's oh, the problem: oh, you, you got to learn the art of clickbait sensationalism, I know, you know? Right? and then maybe you'll get some attention. It seems like. They take all of, you're right, they take, you know, like I imagine a, a whole bunch of people that are pr interested in or, or talking about UFOs in one room, it's it's the few four, five, ten people that are just like, woo, aliens and sensationalizing everything's aliens. They uh -huh. take all the attention in the room and then you've got 90 other people standing here with like interesting mysteries and historical things total, totally ignored. You know? And they, they basically push the, they kind of like shift like the, the window. So to such an extreme that unless you have such a crazy sensational story, all us normal guys are basically called debunkers and skeptics to them, even though that's yeah, not what because, we are Because you're not jumping right on the, I love yeah. the other thing. I love the other thing. Like I do a show and I completely destroy, let's say a single case as completely fake. And we yeah. present overwhelming evidence that that, specific case is fake then i get 25 people messaging me and yelling at me what are you saying Stephen? are you saying ufos aren't real no but that yeah. specific case is is bunk and you should we should know that so we don't you know every case, i would have loved it when i started 
One of the reasons I started this show, Jeff, is I would have loved it when I started if there was a show like mine that we have today, back in the day, so that I could go through if the guy was, you know, adequate researcher and go, okay, I don't waste time on this one. Okay. I don't waste time on this one. Okay. This one's bullshit. This one's bullshit. You know, but it's funny how angry people get, like, just because I'm not willing to accept or because I, I debunk one case as total horse shit doesn't mean I think they're all, I'm just trying to get the garbage out of the room so I could find the, the good stuff, the treasures to me, you know, get the truly the unexplainable. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I get, yeah. I get people that say that all the time. They're like, are you saying it's all bunk? Like you don't believe in but it's like, like, okay. But I, again, like I said, because this one case is bunk does not mean I think there's nothing to the topic. Like I can both call out the bunk in the topic and still have an interest in the topic. A valid interest. Yeah. Study. Yeah. That's what people, yeah. yeah. They, they make assumptions like, you know, people get too attached to, like I said, they get too attached. To, no. Like, and I think both of us, stuff. Jeff, wouldn't you love it if somebody brought you like ear? What if somebody brought you the smoking gun evidence of alien visitation? I, I would cream in my pants. I yeah. would be so happy. So it's not that we're, and I'd be the first to, one to, to go out and it. tell everyone about it. You know, if, yeah. I, if there was real verification, you know, I'd be the first one. You know, it's, so if really people have joked about it, like if you want to convince people, give someone like Mick West or say someone like myself, your solid proof. See what they have to do with it. Yeah. Like if if your stuff was good, they they would admit it. Like you know, I'd admit it. Like like Certainly, it's not yeah. like they got this idea that like, uh, like we just debunk it or we wouldn't accept it because we're afraid of the truth. We're afraid of it. <laughs> yeah. I love that one. No, not at yeah. all, man. I'm all over that. That's all. You we know what want. else I like, love? Jeff? The people are like, people are like messaging me nasty messages. And they say things like, you're going to look like a fool in the next few months, Steven. And that's, and then a year goes by. I feel like messaging them back. Like, Where's that disclosure you said that I was going to look long like game a fool? Something years now, you know. Uh, <laughs> That's so I think stupid. it's going to happen. Yeah, what so did that Phil Class say? Phil Class is a curse or whatever. Curse of the you UFO. Know? You will not know anything more when yeah. you die than you know right now about this mystery. That is the Phil Class yeah. curse. Yeah. But yeah. The, uh, one important thing to know, though, is that this idea that it's some sort of like singular like mystery right like and it's it's not like the the ufo like what people perceive as ufos have lots of explanations it's not like it's some singular phenomenon like like an alien spaceship accounts for everything it'll always be there will always be lots of explanations some sightings will always be meteorological some will be astronomical some will always be planes some will be drones like yeah, yeah so it's, it's if you get disclosure there will still be UFO sightings and they will still have a wide variety of possible solutions. And so yeah. you can only ever look at each case by itself on its own merits. Oh, I agree. But 100%. That's evidence, hand it over. Well, I have to take a moment to thank another kind and generous benefactor, Simon Smith with a kind and generous five pounds who says your hard work is appreciated. Well, thank you for helping us too. I have to negotiate some royalties after the show tonight. <laughs> yes, well, we thank you for your kindness, generosity, and support. Well, Jeff, what you are you? That What's that? Did you see that pen? It just flew on its own out of nowhere. Okay, Mr. Romanek. <laughs> what? Didn't you ever see that Stan Romanek? Like he threw a pencil and then he was like, "Oh, poltergeist!" Yeah, but you could screen? actually see his hand do it. Like, yeah. Camera was too low. And he didn't know that his hand was in the frame. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that guy's still in prison for, for KP. Hopefully. I don't want to say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hopefully. That's <laughs> so, the conspiracy because he was speaking the truth about aliens. That's all the believers tell you. <laughs> I just want to take a moment, too, to remind people that they can follow you on Twitter. It's at M-R-J-E-F-F Knox. At Mr. Jeff Knox. And if you like UFOs, especially the history of UFOs, every day, what do you know this, Mr. Knox? One of the first things I do in the morning is I have my morning caffeinated beverage, and I go look on Twitter, and then, and then I always get to see what happened in the land of UFOs on this date. And that's a cool public service. Talk I about do a, that. I could actually learn something if I actually read the <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a? Do you have plans for? Did you have like a blog or something that you were working on, or no? 
Well, yeah. So, like, I so AFU wanted to put my stuff up on their website, but then the the person, the volunteer they had that was going to do the work disappeared. But then they got a new one, and so I, I'm trying to work on that with them. So all my stuff gets kind of mirrored up there as well. Um, and I, I still want to get a blog. I just get so dedicated to doing this case research, like. I, I could see it. I see, like, it I see it daily. I see it daily. I go, holy shit! Look at this. Twelve thing. hours today already. You know, you were anything. you were on you were on that other show doing this presentation just a few days ago, and I I forgot I couldn't find the link, so I had to go through your Twitter, and I was like, Jesus Christ, man! He's posted all these cases. I had to go through like eighteen pages of Twitter to get to the couple days ago, but it's you're great information if you're interested. Several and, actual today in UFO history post every single day, like several mm -hmm. at least. Sometimes there's 14 or 15 in a single day, and that's just the history, those specific posts. I also post, you know, I try and post like a UFO cartoon or comic, you know, every day if I can, or uh, various, uh, you know, art, UFO art, you know, from old UFO magazines or something. Like I post all sorts of. Yeah, you've got quite a collection, I bet, don't you? Yeah. You got quite a collection of the history, the old stuff, right? You know what I, one of the things I like, Jeff, is old, like 1950s, 1960s UFO literature. Cause yep. it's just, it's, it's so different, but it's still the same. It's like nothing changed in, in, in 80 years, you know? Like it's crazy how yeah, similar like, I, some of the stuff is. Like I, I posted a, an article by Ray Palmer, I think from like the fifties that the article is called like disclosure is imminent. No, it's not <laughs> like, you know, so like all this stuff, like it's just, it's, it's really a repeat. And that's why it's also kind of important to study the history of the topic. Right. So, so you can recognize that this stuff's not new. Like it's been going around for like a while now. And as somebody who knows the history and you probably experience this too, is like, I get people that come up to me and like, they ask like they find out about a case or they think something's brand new they just discovered and it's like sorry man like that's actually pretty pretty old like a lot of people know about that already like like you you really got to study this topic and it takes time you can't just learn about ufos in like you know a month you know you love the guy that read like three books and he's an expert when yeah, exactly. Either. Right. Like, like <laughs> I've read hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and, and that's just books, not to mention other material, like, like I magazines oh, and documentaries. And yeah, and, I still have, I put up in my attic. I still have old VHS tapes of like UFO stuff from back in the day, you know, that's awesome. Yeah. Free YouTube, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can't just learn it, though, from a lot of people, particularly these days, think they can learn everything from a podcast and, you know, history channel. Like, you've actually got to, like, I hate to tell you guys, you got to read some books. Get that page out, you know, use your eyeballs and do some actual reading because there's only so much they can put in a podcast. Or Yeah, a it's called right-click research. If you can't find it on the Internet, they can't find it. I'm like, nope, sometimes you got to pick up the phone and call people. Sometimes you got to read books or go to an archive. Of and, and these days, a lot of books yeah. have been scanned, and a lot of this material is now available. PDFs, yeah. yeah. Free PDFs, like that's, yeah. That's what I do. Like, I will scan books if I need to because I don't have a PDF. But I actually are fortunate to have thousands of books and publications in PDF already. So, like, I, I use those for my posts all the time, is these PDFs. But a lot of it's online. Like, like the Internet Archive has a massive amount of, like, classic UFO books, like, really good UFO books you can, like, look at. The AFU Archive in Sweden has all those 50s and 60s publications that, you know, I love to scroll through them. I'll oh, just go I like this old I go stuff. one issue yeah. from a time. Like I'll I'll pick out some old 1950s thing and look at each issue and just kind of like scroll through it and see what's in it and go from one to one to one. Like it's I just funny how little has changed because some of the stories you could just change the date and it could be a story from today. Yep, you know exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to do this with me tonight, and and I hope you won't be a stranger. I'm going to contact you about the Bob Lazar project. I'd really appreciate. If, even if you just are in this thing for five minutes, because uh, you have such a story to tell about your time investigating that case. Of, are you kind of timing this to kind of counter that Gravatar? I'm, try, I'm trying to, but I've only got 12 minutes of completed film so far. Yeah. 
And it's probably going to end up being at least an hour and a half. So I'm going to try starting next week, Jeff, to have a goal of finishing five minutes or 10 minutes a week. You know, Is that Jeremy Rise or like Michael? I, ha- I haven't I, ha- I haven't asked him yet. Um, uh, Michael Schrat gave me permission to use a clip, though, so far. There's a clip of Michael Schrat destroying the educational credentials and talking about, you know, the men in black stealing all the yearbooks because he went and got the yearbooks and yeah. there's no mention. So he's given me permission to use that clip. Oh, yes. Actually, I asked him if he would be in it. And he said, yes, I'm going to drive down to Virginia where he lives and interview him, cool. you know? And so, uh, yeah, his, uh, his Lazar report is like, it's uh, still great. Yeah. 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 I, when people ask me about Lazar, it's, you know, the, the things I give them basically is like, like the Lazar report, like Tom Mahood's old website, you know, there's a couple of like standard references. I get people like, if they want to learn the truth about Bob Lazar and the Lazar report is still one of them. So. Yeah. 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 I'm going to, I'm going to interview him. And then interestingly, I decided that we can't just hammer Bob Lazar for 90 minutes straight. And I wanted to have somebody that believes his story and I found somebody. So they're also going to be to give sort of a counterpoint so that it's not just total skeptic, you know, but good luck to that guy because he's going to have to do some mental gymnastics and come up with a great method of debate to counter all the evidence that, that the Bob Lazar story, unfortunately, is a fraud. It's my favorite story growing up. That's what got me down the rabbit hole, really. That and seeing a UFO when I was 10 years old. But after that, I found the Bob Lazar story and went, oh, my God, what I saw was aliens. And I believed that for a long, long time, you know. And it was only later. I want to see the true Bob Lazar movie. Like, not about the aliens. Like, because the alien claims aside, that dude led a crazy fascinating life like yeah this is like a crazy story right like like yeah. a movie about his life would involve explosions uh prostitutes fireworks cars, rocket uh, cars rocket bikes yeah. it is a great story even if he's a fraud and the alien claims are fake which i believe they are it's yeah a, he's a, great I, we, I, we I mentioned too see. some of these we love that you and me love the great stories of ufos Yep. But one of the other things I love is some of these characters, even if they're frauds, if they're still fascinating characters. And I love a fascinating, interesting, creative, artistic person. About a guy yeah. that can pull a grift and stick to it and stick to his story and his stuff like for so long. Like it's yeah, it's it's very fascinating. All very right. Well, I'll I'll contact you. I'd appreciate it. If I get you, I've already got Shrat and one other person. If I get you too, I think that this the 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 chances of completion you know it, it gets closer if i got you committed and i've already got a few other people i got to figure out how i'm filming it but yeah I'd i like appreciate to, your input now that he lives in oregon here you know i'd like to go you know spy out his new place one of these days but <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I guess he likes to fly drones around with sparklers under them and tricking people into thinking they're UFO sightings. <laughs> that wouldn't surprise me. Well, I, I appreciate you uh, coming here sure. tonight. Yeah, everybody's got great feedback in the live chat about what a great guest and a great show we've done here. So I appreciate that. And I, I just want to thank you because sometimes, Mr. Knox, I get so critical of all of this shit and so cynical. I forget that you're right. Like there's a fun aspect to this that I should focus on more instead of just hammering scammers <laughs> every night of the week. Right. Yeah. And, and just because it's just because, you know, it's uh, you're not for the bunk and the, the grifters doesn't mean everything has to be super serious. You can still have fun with this topic. This topic should be fun. Like if it's, if you're at the point where you're like these people are just like, so angry and attacking people on Twitter and just like there's so much drama. It's like you're too. You got to step gotta, away. You, yeah, you got to step away, man. Like you, you got to have fun in this topic. You can't get crazy over it. So. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Good advice to end with. So you have a good night. You too. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna wrap up the show. You can leave whenever you're ready. After I toss yeah. you. <laughs> You have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Knox, the one and only Mr. Jeff Knox. I tell, I told you he is a walking encyclopedia. A lot of people often compliment me on my knowledge of UFO history, but he's definitely one person that is world. Him and Michael Schrader worlds above me. 
because uh, there's an awful lot of obscure cases that I've never focused on. Um, and yeah. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Martin Taylor says, excuse my paranoia as I'm recovering from chemotherapy three days ago. I'm delirious. Well, I'm sorry for that. And, uh, I hope that you feel better. I will put you in my prayers. Uh, Mr. Martin Taylor, longtime show supporter. Thanks for being here. UFO Sunset. We'll take a few comments and questions from the live chat. UFO Sunset says, thanks for the great combo. Sure, my pleasure. Same old stuff with the czar, says William Runner. They have confirmation bias and try to interpret what he said based on today. Yeah, and uh, Steve Long... I'll talk to you off air, but one of the reasons I decided to do that is because that UFO believer or the or the person that will sort of play the part of the, you know, sort of play the devil's advocate against our skepticism, he lives in the same state as Michael Schratt. So I could go down there in one weekend and film both of them. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think sprinkled in there, but I do agree with you that there have been 30 years of pro Lazar documentaries and nobody ever gives you the skeptical side of the story. Steve Long, have you heard of the UFO story where an alien made some pancakes and gave it to this old guy? Yeah, I love that one. <laughs> Patty says, Jeff is a great guest. Yeah. And I really do mean what I said, like, Let's let's be let me cards on the table, hard on my sleeve. Be very honest. These shows where I'm just I don't prefer those shows where I'm angry and yelling and screaming and, and so animated. Uh, you know, uh, I just get so like Mr. Knox said, I get so wrapped up in it that I probably should just walk away for a little while and like calm the calm the hell down. It's UFOs, you know. There's wars going on. There's people starving all over the world. There's famines, you know, climate change. There's so many more important things to worry about. Uh, Mike McLeod's amazing UFO video. Uh, he's got to email me. If he emails me the link, he said he was going to put it on YouTube, but I don't know what his YouTube channel is. If somebody knows, and, and he can't just put a link in the description of the video. So Mike McLeod, if you're listening, email me at truthseekershow at gmail.com and send me the link if you did post that um, video that you're talking about. I don't know how amazing it is, Storm Crow. If he sent it to me before and I didn't play it, it's probably, it might not be that great. Um, and, you know, uh, but uh, just a note to say, like, I do appreciate when people send me stuff, but often people send me things that, are really grainy or just you can't even make out what it is it's just a light in the sky and i choose not to play those because if i did um you know there's just no there there with some of the stuff that people send me or people send me stuff that is clearly birds flapping but they claim that's an alien spaceship and you know i um uh, i don't know i just uh some things i just don't play if i don't think there's much to it you know but I do appreciate when people share their personal experiences and send me things. Uh, so, Mike, you can uh, email me. Uh, I can't find just the thing, but uh, this is my email, truthseekershow at gmail.com. I'm sorry. I don't know where the hell the banner is for just my email address. Um, yeah, let me see if I can. Oh, here it is, truthseekershow at gmail.com. You can email me there, Mike, and I'd be happy to play it if you send me the link to the YouTube channel. If you don't uh, do that before I end the broadcast tonight, I'll do it on the very next show. A lot of people also, uh, just to wrap up, have asked me about the press conference of the Peruvian alien mummies. And yeah, boy, what a great story. I didn't get to it tonight. Um, I uh, maybe... If I have time this weekend, I'm going to the cabin tomorrow, but it's supposed to rain. And when it rains, I don't have much to do because all the work that I have to do on the cabin is outside building a porch roof. So uh, if you're anxious for another show, I guess pray for rain at the cabin. If there's if it rains, I'm definitely going to do a show on this Alien Mummies. We've already done two parts on the previous claims made. 
for those unaware, the Peruvian authorities basically raided a press conference because they thought that these people had the mummies there. For those unaware, these mummies are made from human body parts and animal bones stitched together to look like aliens. Um, Vancouver guy wants to eat them. Ha <laughs> ha, woo writers. Did they? I don't think so. No, they they trashed. Well, at least Corbell did. And, and uh, who is that? Uh, Ryan Graves trashed them. To be clear, Lou Elizondo and Gary Nolan backed Jaime Musan. Wouldn't surprise me if they think they could get a payday out of it. The thing I want to email you is only tangent related to ufos but i think you might be interested in looking into it if you decide to branch out from ufos at some point it's pretty cool stuff yeah we're always looking for new show ideas so sure send them to me i want to take a moment to uh remind people to follow me on twitter it's at stephen cambion on twitter um but also uh i want to make a personal note and i'm sure that some assholes are going to say oh you can dish it out but you can't take it um uh, i'm not going to take any wackadoos who just want to harass me or abuse me. So if you reply to one of my Twitter threads, insulting my appearance or my disability or whatever, I mean, if you do it once, I'm not going to care, you know, have at it. I could do first of all, take your, take your meds, right? That's what I tell people take their meds. But um, I just want to remind people that I have no, uh, I have, no reason to take abuse, harassment, or or people being nasty. If you want to ask me a question, we don't have an echo chamber here. You can come in my live chat during every live broadcast and ask any questions you want. But if you're going to, you know, post memes or, you know, attacking my appearance or make fun of my disability, for those unaware, I have something called third nerve palsy, uh, which is a paralyzed eye. I can't do anything about it. So, you know, great. I uh, I guess, and and what gets me is they never, they never attack the evidence that I share, on the show. Never, never. It's always my appearance or your one-eyed Willie or you know, uh, this. I'm I'm just I'm not going to deal with it anymore. So you know, or uh, you know, I've got people, uh, I've got people with uh, you know, they just want to constantly argue with me of, oh your set's too dark or you know they just want to be a critic and complain go fuck yourself start your own show if you don't like mine i've said it before there's a reason the set's dark because i'm half blind and i need the set to be dark to see the goddamn screen to run the show i'm not going to apologize for that um and uh, by the way a lot of people like the set here and like the aesthetics here so i'm not going to change it i like it if you don't like it you know Hey, what, what did uh, David Wilcox say? Art is subjective, right? Uh, anyway, well, I don't know what that's about. Um, what does that mean, Mark? What does that mean? I'm aware that a certain other show host was grifting off of his audience, wanting $5,000 to apologize to me, right? He did the wrong thing. Another one of those people making fun of my physical disability, like a piece of shit. You know, I always say to those people, aren't there some kids in wheelchairs you can go make fun of next? Like, like for real, I can't do anything about it. You, people who have a physical disability. They can't do anything about it. So if you make fun of somebody for something they can't change or control, then you're a piece of shit. But apparently another show host is telling people, well, I'll apologize if somebody gives me five thousand dollars. No, you're a piece of shit. <laughs> You got to love it, friends. So I don't know about the rest of you, but I feel like I've done my due diligence. We've got, we produced, uh, we've, I don't know, we did a couple of extra during the day uh, replays, the David Wilcox Channel's Raw episode, which I think is really funny, and a David Wilcox sniffing and, and you know, the cat piss, and he spent $5,000 or something like that on an Airbnb that smelled like cat piss and it's all a conspiracy. So look at our video section and then coming up, we do have some incredible replays. We got great feedback on that original Anjali uh, video, which we replayed last week. And 
Tomorrow night at 9 p.m., we're replaying the interview with one of the original witnesses to her alien tunnel and alien mountain base event. And he blows her whole story completely to shit. I think that's one of my favorite episodes ever. That's tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I'll be at the cabin, but I will be in the live chat. And uh, then we're playing on Saturday night. We're playing the Anjali interview where she came back for a sec second interview after one of her witnesses <laughs> blew her story to crap and she got pissed off and she walked off the interview because I did raise my voice and say, there's no mountain. Those things don't exist. There's no tunnel. And she got pissed off. Uh, and, and actually, I just kind of reviewed that. I actually feel bad for her reviewing that because she looks distraught and nervous and, you know, because her whole story came crashing down. Um, yeah. And yes, on Sunday night, there's another episode of Corey Good's Space Journeys uh, this weekend. That's Sunday night at 9 p.m. Uh, and thanks to Mr. Ian for doing them, right? Vancouver guy says, I am generous with my time with pretty much everyone who wants my help with something. But if you make it personal, I'm disengaging. Yeah, that's how I feel. Like, you know, these people act like I have some responsibility to reply to them when they start the conversation. You know, I could show you a typical example. Some guy started the conversation, was on my Twitter thread, and he said, who cares if this guy exposes people? Only He's only got 1,500 followers. And I had to correct him, you know. So then I get angry because he's lying to me. I'm like, 1,500 followers? Dude, uh, I have 10,000 Twitter followers, 25 or 30,000 Facebook followers across multiple Facebook sites, uh, 6,000 on Twitter. I, you know, I know I don't have 1,500 followers. I'll, I'll help you with the first grade math. And then, then he just more insults, right? Yeah, I'm not going to engage with you. Suck a dick, dude. Suck a dick and die. That's how I feel, right? And, and by the way, if you want to attack me on evidence I present being factually incorrect or or not right, I'm all for it. And you know, and yes, I've made some mistakes, and we've we've offered clarifications, or you know, we've corrected the record. I'm fine with that. But if you just want to insult me, like screw this guy, he doesn't have enough followers, so he's not important, or whatever, no. You know where you can go. Uh, I don't have a responsibility to reply to nasty wackadoos off their meds who believe the aliens are here and I'm part of the CIA disinformation op. No, uh, no. And the other thing is, I've talked about this before. Uh, I have a real time crunch in my life right now. I've got, uh, you know, two children. One of them has special needs and requires constant care and attention. I've got a wife. I've got this cabin, these cabin projects, two big cabin projects. I've got two floors that I have to redo in my home, a big one, a kitchen floor and a small one, a bathroom floor. I've got a huge outside project this spring to do at my home. We have some drainage problems and I'm going to be digging for two weeks straight. I don't have time for wackadoos, I, especially nasty wackadoos. I just don't have time. So because of my time constraints, I'm just cutting out. I used to I used to argue with these people. It's a pointless endeavor. They they're never gonna we're never gonna reach like some kind of agreement or find common ground. Not especially when you start the conversation, call me one eyed Willie, or you know, posting. I love the grandma's boy memes. Like, is that the best you have, you loser? Right? Is that the best you could do? Attack my appearance? But I know so, on some other show hosts, they do the same thing. Right. They pick out something they think is going to bother you, like your weight or your whatever, your appearance and um, and attack you on that. But isn't it interesting that they can't attack the evidence that some people present? So they go right to personal attacks. Right. Well, and there's Lucy Day, uh, another five. I, this Lucy Day. Thank you. Lucy Day is a longtime show supporter who's been buying gift memberships for uh, members of the of the subscriber list here. For those unaware. If you subscribe, if you're a subscriber but not yet a YouTube channel member, people like kind of generous people like Lucy Day gift memberships. And when that happens, YouTube randomly gives those out to subscribers of our channel here that are not yet members. So you can get some extra goodies just by clicking that subscribe button if you're lucky. 
And uh, thank you, Lucy Day, uh, for all your kindness, generosity, and support. We also want to take a moment to thank our kind and generous Patreon supporters and our uh, YouTube channel members, Twitch subscribers, PayPal pledgers, anybody throwing a couple bucks in our hat. Uh, you have my sincere thanks. Thanks for appreciating appreciating us, and thank you for being so generous. Lucy Day, I think, has bought 15 guest memberships this month. Praise the cash! All right. Uh, we thank you uh, for your kindness, generosity, and support, all of you. Uh, it means a lot to me that people care enough to help us. After all, we are a viewer-supported show, uh, and without support, the show goes away. Uh, I'm thankful for all the support that we have. Uh, by the way, just a personal note, I have survived being a small business owner with an accountant wife. Uh, for those who are aware, my wife is an accountant. Now, she's she she gets angry at me because she is not uh, a tax accountant. She is a payroll accountant. Um, but because I am a complete and total mess as a man and a business person, you know, I, I think she knows and recognizes, like, my strengths in life are creative and artistic things. But the business side of things, like keeping records and receipts and things, <laughs> I'm not so good at that. So every year it's like a nightmare. I got to find her all these receipts and give her all this stuff from every, you know, we got, I got to give her the, the spreadsheets or whatever from Twitch and Patreon and PayPal and, and uh, you know, whatever, YouTube and all this. I got to have all this paperwork for her. And then it takes her hours and hours and hours to go through my mess and fix it. <laughs> I survived. I think we're done. And uh, I want to thank each and every one of you because going through those taxes um, reminded me of how generous everyone is here. We certainly did much better in support this year for this year's tax season than we did last year. Uh, not a huge jump, but growth. I'll take it. So thank you all for your kindness, generosity, and support. So we've done our due diligence, but I'll be in the live chat Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern. We're going to try to... 9 p.m. Eastern, seven days a week, whether it's a replay or me being live or, or you know, flashback episode, whatever. Uh, so 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is Truth Seekers time. We'll have something fun for you, I think, every night going forward. We're going to try to keep that going. I we were doing that for a while, and then I slacked off. And then, of course, the numbers slack off. So you go, maybe I should take the time to prepare those things and get them together. And uh, plus people want me to do them. So we, we aim to please here. So we want to thank all of you kind and generous benefactors. We want to thank our wonderful guest, Mr. Jeff Knox. You can follow him on Twitter at M-R-J-E-F-F-K-N-O-X, at Mr. Jeff Knox on Twitter. Uh, yeah, so that's all I got for you, friends. I am looking forward to some cabin time. Hopefully, if it doesn't rain too much, I might make a little bit of progress on that porch roof. Um, and I should be probably checking in from the cabin, even if it's just to be in the live chat for the replays. Appreciate your attendance tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Saturday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and Sunday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So that's all we got for you, friends. Until next time, my name is Stephen Cambion. Good night, and God bless all of you.